For the first time since classical antiquity, a Western artist asserts his own vision and Western art finds its own distinctive style, Romanesque. Although the Roman Empire was conquered by the barbarians and the lands of Western Europe were overrun by pagan tribes in the Dark Ages, Roman civilization and above all Roman Christianity triumphed in the long run. Converted to the new faith, the former barbarians became the heirs of Rome and the founders of modern Europe. In the 11th and 12th centuries, the period we call Romanesque, there was a remarkable revival of art and especially architecture, when, in the words of a contemporary, it was as if the whole earth had cast off her old age and was clothing herself everywhere in a white garment of churches. Two of the most powerful forces moulding the development of Romanesque art and architecture were pilgrimage and the monastic movement. And the Romanesque church here at Vézelay in France embodies both. Benedictine monastery and starting point on the pilgrimage route to Santiago in Spain. The story of Vézelay echoes the story of Europe during the crucial years of transition between the 9th century and the 12th. It was founded in the 860s in the great cultural and artistic revival of the French Emperor Charlemagne. It was burned down by the Vikings in the violent years of the 9th and 10th centuries. At that time, Western Europe was assailed on every side by Slavs, Magyars, Saracens and Vikings, and many people thought that Christian civilization itself might not pull through. In response, powerful dynasties built great strings of fortresses in which their beleaguered populations could shelter. In the 1100s, Europe turned the corner. Suddenly, almost as if the passing of the millennium was the release, we see a dramatic revival in the use of monumental sculpture and large-scale architecture, such as had only been glimpsed fitfully in the previous centuries. The cult of saints and the passion for pilgrimage to their shrines were dominant features of medieval culture. One of the most famous was the pilgrimage to Santiago in Spain, because the church was believed to house one of the sacred relics of Christendom, the bones of St. James, Santiago in Spanish, one of Christ's 12 apostles. From the top of the tower at Vézelay, you can still make out the old way of St. James winding its way through the hills on its way to Spain. It's astonishing to think that hundreds of thousands of men and women made that pilgrimage during the medieval period. They undertook such arduous journeys for a multitude of reasons. To plead for divine help, to ask for the cure of illness, to give thanks for favors given, to ask for penance for their sins. But above all, they went for the salvation of their souls. To achieve the state of grace conferred by his relics, they traveled great distances on foot, by boat, on horseback, wearing the typical pilgrim's garb, the hat, the staff, the cockle shell symbol of St. James. But pilgrimage was not only a spiritual force, it was a dynamic, transforming element in society, enabling the exchange of ideas, goods, and especially of money. There was a great deal of money to be made from pilgrimage. Indeed, it was the offerings to the saints and their relics by pilgrims in their thousands that helped pay the construction costs of the great Romanesque pilgrim churches lining the main roads to Santiago. There were four main routes that went through France to Spain. These roads joined at Puente la Reina in Spain, where a single road passed through Burgos and Leon and culminated at Santiago de Compostela. 
In the center of France, the major starting point was the Church of Mary Magdalene at Vézelay. This great Romanesque abbey church at Vézelay, in the heart of Burgundy, is built far too large for the needs of its local population. Paul Crossley is a distinguished architectural historian whose special interest is Romanesque and Gothic architecture. It served primarily two functions. It housed a large and prosperous community of Benedictine monks. And secondly, and most importantly, it was one of the foremost places of pilgrimage in France. For here was contained the relics of St. Mary Magdalene. Thousands of pilgrims came through the western portals of this church and they found themselves in a sacred way. A long avenue of arches and aisles which led them to the distant and luminous choir where the body of St. Mary Magdalene was contained. To the devout medieval Christian, a holy relic had the power to perform miracles. Even the tiniest fragment of the body of a saint encased in its reliquary represented the power, the presence of the saint. Much of the art of the time was geared to the cult of saints and their relics. Medieval artists lavished their skill on these reliquaries. Only the most precious jewels and workmanship were considered worthy to hold, for example, a splinter of wood from the cross of the crucifixion. Or, or the skull of St. John the Baptist. or the cloak of the Virgin Mary, or the arm of a bishop, or a saint. Now, the status of a church and its attraction for pilgrims depended on the number and the importance of the relics that it held. Churches competed for relics and even stole them from each other. A vision commanded us to steal it, they would say, or the saint told us she was unhappy in that place. If relics gave spiritual comfort, images carved or painted, instructed and terrified, to a largely illiterate congregation, images were essential to convey the church's message. In Burgundy, Otain Cathedral is one of the most important pilgrimage churches on the route to Santiago. Otain was lucky to be able to attract to its workshop in around the year 1130, a sculptor of genius. We know his name, which is a rarity in the largely anonymous art of the early Middle Ages. He was called Gislibertus, and he signed himself Gislibertus Hoc Fecit. Gislibertus did this. He has a style distinctly his own, vivid and with a feeling for expressive detail unprecedented in Romanesque sculpture. His tympanum shows the last judgment and in the center is the serene figure of Christ the Judge, the focus around which the whole composition of the tympanum turns. At its edges, angels blow the final trumpets. On Christ's right-hand side are the saved. One of them wears the cockle-shell badge of St. James to prove that his soul had been redeemed by making a pilgrimage to Santiago. Little souls are already being received by angels. On his left-hand side are the damned. 
With lust, the young woman with serpents gnawing at her breasts, singled out especially. And perhaps most frightening of all, this pair of disembodied claws which appears from nowhere and clutches a screaming soul. St. Michael the Archangel is weighing the souls. Opposite him, a hideous devil is trying to tip unfairly the scales in his favor by pulling on them or inserting little demons into the scales. Cowering souls hide in St. Michael's coattails. And across this whole nightmare runs the inscription, let this terror appall all those bound by earthly sin. This figure of Eve is one of the first monumental nudes of the Middle Ages. Seductive and sensual, she is the image of the sinner, the first sinner. Her left hand clutches at the apple. Her right hand is raised to her cheek in shame. Eve was originally placed on the lintel of the north portal of Autun Cathedral. This was the penitence portal. It was very appropriate that Eve should be here. All the capitals with narrative scenes on them are carved by Gislibertus. Gislibertus shows us here, for example, the adoration of the Magi cut in deep relief, often using the drill to create charming effects of texture and surface. Around the corner of the capital, St. Joseph sits a little disconsolate. Another scene shows the flight into Egypt. And perhaps the most moving of all the scenes is the dream of the Magi, in which the Magi lie in their bed and the angel comes to them, as if in a vision, touching their hands and pointing with his other finger to the star of Bethlehem, which is to lead the Magi. is Libertus's most dramatic composition is this one, the suicide of Judas, where the screaming devils are even pulling on Judas's rope to hasten his death. Along with pilgrimage, the second great influence on Romanesque art and architecture was monasticism. The monastic ideal had long been a spiritual goal of humankind, from the farthest reaches of Ireland to the high Himalaya. But Western monasticism only really began after the fall of the Roman Empire in response to the collapse of political power. Self-contained, self-sufficient communities cut off from the world. The most famous order, the Benedictine, was founded by Saint Benedict in the sixth century. His great rule, poverty, chastity, and obedience insisted on a life devoted to manual labor, devoted to prayer and to the copying and interpretation of the sacred texts. Decorating these books was an act of devotion. During the Middle Ages, sumptuous manuscript illuminations were the most important form of painting in Western art. By 1100, endowed with massive grants of land from kings and nobles, the great orders, the Benedictine, the Cluniac, the Cistercian, 
held virtual monastic empires across Europe, powerful patrons of art and architecture. This beautiful building is the Priory Church of paris le monial and it is in fact a perfect example of Cluniac Romanesque architecture at it, the height of its powers. Where does the term Romanesque come from? Like many other widely used words in the history of art, like Impressionism or Gothic, Romanesque began its life as a derogatory term. Historians in the early 19th century thought that the massive pillars and great vaults of Romanesque buildings looked rather like a debased form of Roman architecture. And so they called it Romanesco or Romanesque. In fact, the term couldn't be more apt. For early medieval patrons and architects were constantly looking back to the glories of the classical Roman past, trying to build in the classical language of architecture, in Christian form. But to fourth century Christians, it was a practical matter. Needing places of worship, they took over the long Roman basilica, which became the standard form for Christian architects in the West. Gradually, over the centuries, these architects transformed the Roman form. They first added a great transept to it, thus making the church into a symbolic cross shape. At the west end of the building, they added towers, breaking up the horizontal silhouette of the basilica with vertical forms. At the east end, they retained the Roman apse, but made choirs more sophisticated with radiating chapels. And inside the building, they broke up the simple walls of the Roman basilica with openings for the galleries and for the windows. And instead of the flat wooden roofs of the early basilicas, they used Roman-style vaults. In the Middle Ages, paris le art would never have been used for weddings, but nevertheless, the Cluniac monks did encourage a large lay congregation. But this church is not just a superb example of monastic architecture. It's a model by which we can understand the whole of high Romanesque architecture in France. As a pilgrim or a member of the lay congregation, we would have entered this building through a porch and found ourselves in the wide and splendid nave, either in the central aisle, where I'm standing, or in the wide side aisles. We would have moved up the church to the crossing behind me, so-called because it's here that the nave of the church crosses with those side spaces called the transepts, and beyond them, the most holy part of the church with the choir, the high altar, behind which the most important relics were displayed, and beyond the altar, the curving ambulatory with the chapels radiating off it. Hundreds of pilgrims crowding into the church were dangerous and noisy. And so the medieval architect evolved this superb corridor around the high altar, which we call an ambulatory. This solved perfectly what one scholar has called the traffic problem of the medieval pilgrimage. But perhaps most distinctive of high Romanesque architecture here is the great tunnel or barrel vault above my head. Almost every great church in France from the 11th century onwards had these stone vaults, and for very good reasons. Until then, most churches had simple timber roofs over them. And as you can imagine, in buildings that were lit largely with candles, this was a terrible fire hazard. But there were other advantages in these great vaults as well. They were visually beautiful. They were acoustically marvelous. The Cluniacs spent most of their day here in the choir, chanting the divine services. 
and their Gregorian chants would be taken by these barrel vaults upwards and dispersed through the whole church. So stone vaults were very much needed in Romanesque architecture in the late 11th and early 12th centuries. But they posed considerable problems for architects then. They had no scientific knowledge of engineering. They also had very primitive equipment, simple wooden cranes and simple scaffolding. There were bound to be failures. Vaults often collapsed in the Middle Ages. If a Romanesque architect wished, however, to find a good model for large stone vaulting, he could do no better than to look at the well-preserved examples of Roman vaulting, which he could have found in the south of France or all around him here in Burgundy. Less than a mile from this Roman gate in the nearby town of Autun stands Autun Cathedral. Like Paris Le Monial, the cathedral is a perfect example of the influence of classical Roman architecture on the Romanesque architect. We can see the classical forms everywhere here. The fluted pilasters crowned at the top by Corinthian capitals. And in the middle story of the building, this characteristic composition of round arches separated by flat pilasters and closed by a horizontal cornice. These forms come straight from the local Roman precedent here in Autun, the Porte d'Arou. The Romanesque style spread right across Europe. In 1066, it crossed the English Channel with the Norman conquest of England. Normans destroyed most of the main Anglo-Saxon churches, replacing them with ones built in the French Romanesque, or, as it is known in Britain, the Norman style. And it would be in England that some of the most daring and original innovations were made in medieval architecture. Durham Cathedral, even by the standards of Norman architecture in England, is a colossal building. Durham Cathedral was begun in 1093 on the sort of scale and grandeur common to many great Norman cathedrals of England in the late 11th century. Durham is a masterpiece of structure and that makes it in a way a slightly ambiguous building because Durham is undoubtedly a Romanesque church. And in fact, it is a massive Romanesque building, one of the largest, but it also has Gothic elements in it. In the 19th century, archaeologists define the Gothic style as having three essential characteristics. The pointed arch, the rib vault, and the flying buttress. And Durham has got all three of these. It's got pointed arches in the nave of the building. Durham's also got rib vaults. In fact, it's perhaps one of the first buildings in Europe consistently to use rib vaults throughout the whole structure. And finally, Durham does have flying buttresses. You can't see them from down here below, but they do exist up in the dark triforium, supporting the gallery roofs, of course, but also taking some of the lateral thrust of these great vaults outwards and downwards onto the ground. Well, do these three features make Durham a Gothic building? Of course they don't. Because Durham, like every other Romanesque church, perhaps even more so, supports the thrust of its vaults on great walls and pillars. It's not the buttresses that support this structure. It's the sheer weight of the masonry. Of course, there's ornament at Durham, very exotic. There is the use, perhaps for the first time in England, of chevron ornament, this zigzag ornament. 
and perhaps most uh, famously, are the extraordinary incised patterns that the Masons have placed around the great columns at Durham. It is precisely this mixture in Durham of strong Romanesque forms and the beginnings of Gothic elements that make it so important in the history of European architecture. Back here at Vézelay, the very moment of historical change can still be seen in the two distinct parts of the church, the Romanesque nave and the choir here, pure Gothic. And only 70 years separates the two. This heyday of the Romanesque style in the West had drawn on many influences native, Roman, Byzantine, and even further afield. And that reveals a characteristic of the art of the West from then until now. It has always sought change. And the 11th and 12th centuries were a period of uh, unceasing experimentation, with artists and craftsmen forever groping for new ideas and better techniques. The demolition of the Romanesque choir here at Vézelay, almost new, and its replacement by the Gothic would soon be mirrored across Europe. But those Gothic ideas that we saw prefigured at Durham were not at first followed up in England. It was North France which gave birth to the new style, a style which to contemporaries must have made the dignified Romanesque seem old-fashioned almost overnight. But a style which ushered in one of the greatest of all periods in the history of the art of the world the age of Gothic. Eleven forty five. In this year, says a contemporary, Robert of Torigny, the people of Chartres began to drag carts harnessed to their own shoulders, laden with stone and wood and other provisions for the building of the new church. The silence only broken by their cries to God for forgiveness of their sins. The story of the cult of carts takes us to the heart of one of the most remarkable periods in the art of the West, the age of the Gothic cathedrals. And of all the churches built then, one has come to stand for all the rest, Chartres. The church at Chartres was burned down on several occasions between the 8th century and the 12th, but each time the people of Chartres willed its rebuilding. The craftsmen, the sculptors, the glaziers, the masons, the construction workers flooded in from far and wide. But it was the people of Chartres themselves who provided the basis in the money raised by the sale of the produce of their own labors. But they also provided the emotional commitment, and sometimes that could reach fever pitch, as in 1145. In 1194, the church was again burned down, leaving only the great west gate, the western towers, and the ancient crypt. Miraculously, their most sacred relic, the tunic of the Virgin Mary, survived intact in the crypt, to the joy of the people. And even more miraculously, the entire church was rebuilt in 27 years. And that is the church that we can still see today. Now, what the cathedral meant to the people who lived in these streets in the 13th century is very different from what it means today. Then, the cathedral was not only the center of spiritual life, it was the focus of civic pride, and daily life literally revolved around it. As in many medieval towns, 
the western gates of the cathedral formed one side of a great open square. In the Middle Ages, this was the place where the townspeople could meet the farmers and the produce of the countryside could be bought and sold. Here, too, they could mingle with tinkers and peddlers, salt sellers, dealers in relics, and the whole gallery of nefarious characters who thronged the roads of Christendom at that time. The important rituals of people's lives centered in the church. In the church, the infant was baptized, the young were married, and prayers were offered for the souls of the dead. The tremendous outpouring of skill, labor, and faith represented in the age of Gothic cathedrals needs to be understood in the light of the great changes happening in Western Europe between 1100 and 1300. And the most important of these was a dramatic population boom. As Europe grew more stable and more prosperous, men and women seemed to have married younger and had bigger families. As a result, the population of the West increased threefold in those two centuries, and in the richest parts, up to tenfold. Hundreds of new towns were founded, and the old ones thrived as local and long-distance trade flourished. At the same time, there were new intellectual impulses, evidenced best of all in the founding of the great universities, Paris, Oxford, and Cambridge. And inside the church, great scholars such as Peter Abelard uh, attempted to wrestle afresh with those eternal problems of the relationship between the rational and logic and faith. So everywhere, there was a sense of change. Nowhere is this sense of change revealed more dramatically than in architecture. In a drab suburb of Paris, at the Church of Saint-Denis, once the glorious burial place of the kings of France, we can pinpoint the moment of transition to the new visionary Gothic style. It's very rare in the history of Western architecture when we can see a new style born in a new place in one monument at a very specific moment in time. But such is the case here where, we, for the very first time, the Gothic style was created. William Clark is an art historian who has made new contributions to our knowledge of Saint-Denis and Chartres. The new style of architecture is characterized by these tall, thin columns, their foliage capitals, that lift up the now even ceiling height, a network of pointed arches and rib vaults. These things had been used before, but what's new, indeed unique, here at Saint-Denis is the new sense of the organization of the space. The divisions are now played down in favor of an overall unified space that flows from one side of the building to the other. The differences from Romanesque architecture are clear. Romanesque architecture had massive, heavy, thick walls and divided spaces. Here at Saint-Denis, the divisions between units, like the walls between the radiating chapels, have simply disappeared in favor of this vast expanse of space that uh, seems to float around us. And it's filled with light. The wall, well, as a surface, has disappeared and has been replaced by translucent screens of glass. All this was due to the influence of one of the most extraordinary people in 12th century France, the man who conceived the new building, Abbot Suger of Saint-Denis. Suger believed that the light flooding the choir through the stained glass windows becomes divine light, a revelation of the Spirit of God. Thus it was possible, he said, to create in a church a strange region of the universe 
suspended between earth and heaven. Suger also placed gold and jeweled objects everywhere in his church, for these two were felt to reflect the divine light. In June 1144, Suger consecrated the new choir at Saint-Denis in the presence of the King of France, his nobles, and the chief archbishops and bishops. Dazzled by what they saw, they returned home inspired to equal or even outdo Suger's creation. Reims, Sens, Saint-Lys, Soissons, Beauvais, Canterbury, and Chartres would soon show the influence of the new Saint-Denis. The medieval cathedral was the focus of popular pride and intense rivalry, for the prestige and importance of a town was determined to a large extent by the size and height and beauty of its cathedral. This rivalry pushed church spires to unprecedented heights. The spire of Chartres would extend beyond the top of a 30-story skyscraper. A 40-floor skyscraper would be needed to surpass the spire at Strasbourg. The dimensions of the cathedral at Amiens made it possible for the entire population of the city, some 10,000 people, to attend one ceremony. But it was in the height of the vaulting that the most intense competition reigned. When the vaulting of Notre Dame in Paris achieved a height of 108 feet, Chartres rose 121 feet above the ground. Reims then surpassed this with 125 feet. Next, Amiens rose 139 feet. Finally, Beauvais Cathedral, which would have beaten them all with a vault of 158 feet, went beyond the limits of safety and medieval engineering skill, and the walls of the choir collapsed. Despite isolated disasters like Beauvais, Gothic triumphed over much of Europe within a few generations. At Canterbury, when the choir was destroyed in the Great Fire of 1174, it was rebuilt in the new Gothic style. England was the first to adopt the Gothic. Not surprising in a country with close dynastic and historical links with France. But English architects always tended to go their own way, favoring length over height, evolving their own forms, often by deliberately misinterpreting their French models. By the early 14th century, at Wells Cathedral, the deep-rooted English tendency toward architectural fantasy broke free, producing daring innovation. Most striking and eccentric are the massive strainer arches added to reinforce the supports of the crossing tower. And that most notable of English contributions to Gothic, the elaborately patterned vault with its delicate tracery of stone. During the heyday of Gothic, hundreds of cathedrals and thousands of churches were built across Europe. In that time, it has been estimated that more stone was quarried in France alone than in the entire history of ancient Egypt. At the heart of Gothic was a combination of all the arts, transformed by religious faith into a mystical vision. And it is at Chartres that these elements are felt to have achieved their greatest harmony. The west front of Chartres, the so-called Royal Portal, is the only group to survive the calamitous fire of 1194. The faithful were greeted by rows of Old Testament kings and queens, recalling the biblical ancestry claimed by the 12th century French kings.
these Old Testament prophets and kings and queens give us a very clear sense of the new relationship between sculpture and architecture. They stand away from their architectural background. They float serenely in space, touching neither the bottom nor the top. Their lines are dictated by those of the architecture behind them, thus their tall, slim, and vertical proportions. Uh, but they are at the same time remarkably free from their architectural constraints, at once majestic, dignified, but no longer remote. They're very human and approachable in their facial expressions and their emotions. Up above in the tympanum, uh, we have uh, Christ in majesty with the four evangelist symbols. With the elders of the apocalypse uh, and angels, a majestic vision symbolizing, in fact, the promise of salvation. Unlike the teeming and crowded uh, tympanum uh, of Saint-Lazare at Autun, whose subject was the last judgment in all its terrifying detail, here we have the promise of salvation and a serenity and a majesty and above all an approachable humanity that animates the sculpture here. We see in them the very embodiment of the mid-12th century humanism that is so prevalent in the school of Chartres at this very time. One of the most exciting things that happens at Chartres is that you can move from the west front to the north transept and you change completely the sense of style in the sculpture and a complete change that's taken place in the attitude towards the human body. These figures are now much freer and seem to move. They have animated facial expressions. The drapery falls around the bodies and reveals it in its contours. We've got the Old Testament kings and prophets again on both sides. All of these emphasize salvation through sacrifice. Abraham, for instance, is preparing to sacrifice his son Isaac, as God commanded him. He looks up at the angel, who orders him to substitute the ram. Both the north and south transept portals belong to the new cathedral, built after the 1194 fire. The south side follows shortly after the north, so the same changes we saw there are now even more advanced. Here, for instance, is the warrior Saint Theodore. With the weight borne on one foot, like the classical contrapposto pose, he's liberated from the architectural framework. In contrast to the other biblical figures, for the very first time, he is now dressed and armed as a contemporary 13th century crusader. The human form and its natural depiction, now sanctioned by the church, released the creative energies of the Gothic sculptor. Soon, a great variety of individualized figures blossomed on cathedrals, not only in France, but all over Europe. The great age of Gothic cathedrals then was an unparalleled time of expansiveness in European society. But in saying that, we mustn't forget that during those years, the mass of society was still dependent peasantry, unfree, laboring under an extraordinarily rigid social system. It was perhaps because their lives were so harsh that the cathedral meant so much to them.
There could hardly be a greater contrast between the squalid conditions of their lives and the splendor of the cathedral to which they quite literally looked up. Here in Chartres we see the culmination of 50 years of architectural experimentation and development, all brought together by a master builder and to create a completely new sense of Gothic space. We start at the floor with those tall, uh, lean pillars that rise majestically from the floor, uninterrupted towards their capitals and their arcades, and on the front side, directly towards the vaults. The second level is that horizontal wall passage that provides a little relief from the vertical and that prepares us for the most spectacular achievement in shot, those enormous clear story windows. Uh, windows that are as tall as the arches below and windows that take up the full expanse of the wall that marks it as the beginning of the classic age of French Gothic cathedrals, the period that we call the High Gothic. Chartres has more of its original glass than any other medieval cathedral. What makes possible the size of those windows and the openness of that wall is, in fact, the last major structural advance in Gothic architecture. The external flying buttresses that take all the weight and the pressures from the vaults, from the timber roof, and transfer it away from the wall directly into the ground. Romanesque architecture doesn't have this advantage. There, we have short, heavy piers, thick walls with small windows, round arches, and groin vaults creating solid, but not very tall buildings. In the Gothic church, the walls do not carry the whole weight of the structure. The inner piers are slim and narrow. The rib vaults are thin under a tall timber roof. Massive windows take up most of the wall. This openness was possible because the structural support has been moved to the outside. Massive upright piers surround the building. Giant arches, like great arms, spring from them to resist the pressures of weight and wind. particularly in chart, and I think it is unique. It's all its uh, ensemble of stained glass. It gives an atmosphere. It uh, gives really what the people of the time wanted to be. Uh, it is a church. It is a church in which people pray. So the stained glass is to give a light which is not natural life, which is another light. Anne Prache is an eminent French medievalist who has devoted much of her professional life to the study of the Cathedral of Chartres and its stained glass windows. The moment you get inside this church, the light changed. 
So you are really in another world, in a sacred world. It must have been a very great enterprise to uh, decorate such a church. Uh, it is supposed to cover about seven acres of windows, which is something terrific when you think of the means the people had at the time. The church is dedicated to the Virgin, and you find her everywhere. She is the center of all the decoration of the church. If you look at the central window on the west facade, which is the larger window ever made in the 12th century, 11 meters, something like 30 feet high, you have a great composition, a kind of decoration, just as you could see on murals or on tapestries or on great mosaics. You can see that on top of the window she is enthroned between angels, so she is really the queen of heaven. For the stained glass makers, they had no large pieces of glass. They had only small pieces of them because they blew the glass. They could not produce it as it is produced today. So they could produce only little bits of glass. So each time they wanted to change the color, they had to change the piece of glass. And to put all the glass, the pieces of glass together, they had to uh, have lead going all around. So it's like a mosaic. If you start studying these windows, you can learn a lot about the life of the Middle Ages. We have the furriers, we have even the sculptors, and probably it's one of the best representations of the 13th century. It's really a great documentation for us. So I think this stained glass of Chartres is really telling about the way people lived, the way they thought, the way they prayed, uh, all their ideals and beliefs. The cathedrals of the Gothic age, like Chartres, were indeed, as Abbot Suger had said, new works suffused by a new light. In that combination of soaring stonework, sculpture, and painted glass, they had created an art to set beside and even to surpass the works of classical antiquity. As we've seen, theirs was a living art which had taken centuries to come to fruition, and it still has the power to astonish us by the sheer quantity and quality of the great churches the vast areas they covered, the huge spaces they enveloped, and their ethereal beauty. Their art originated slowly and painfully, but those who came after them, the artists whom we now call those of the early Renaissance, would truly be standing on the shoulders of giants. <laughs>